Chapter 3 Education and the Autonomy of Critical Thought The philosophe of the Enlightenment attacked Christian faith and thought with unrelenting hostility and venom. As Peter Gay admitted in Voltaire's case that philosophe, quote, publicly denounced the Jesuits as power-mad, sly and as a lot revolting pederasts, end quote, but, quote, privately conceded that his old Jesuit teachers had been decent men and respectable scholars, end quote. His language with reference to the clergy was consistently vicious and coarse. Voltaire spoke of them as, quote, those buggers, the reverend fathers, end quote, and used many other terms of abuse. It was, of course, Voltaire himself who was sexually derelict. As a young man, he had, quote, co-opted into a precious society of wealthy gourmands, brilliant talkers and homosexuals who took impiety for granted. It was the mark of membership, end quote. Voltaire's problem was that no term was for him sufficient to express the infamy of Christianity. The battle cry of Voltaire and of the Enlightenment, Écraser l'infâme, was not merely directed against the Church, but, quote, was directed against Christianity itself, against Christian dogma in all its forms, Christian institutions, Christian ethics, and the Christian view of man, end quote. Christianity had to be destroyed to remove from man the shame and disgrace which it conveyed. The basic and central offence of Christianity was its doctrine of authority, the concept that an absolute and sovereign God has an absolute authority over man, is man's only saviour and provides man with an infallible word. As Peter Gay correctly insisted, quote, the citadel, end quote, of Greek thought, of Renaissance philosophy and Enlightenment faith was, quote, the autonomy of critical thought, end quote. Christian thoughts might be highly intellectual, rational, empirical or scientific, but as long as it moved in terms of the Christian faith, it was anathema. The Christian concept of authority was seen as the betrayal of man. The biblical, the Augustinian concept, asserted the priority of faith. The prophet Isaiah had said, quote, If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. End quote. Isaiah 7, 9. Translated by the Septuagint, Unless you believe, you will not understand. Faith precedes knowledge, blessing and works. St. Elzem summed up the biblical position simply, quote, I do not endeavour, O Lord, to penetrate thy sublimity, for in no wise do I compare my understanding with that, but I long to understand in some degree thy truth, which my heart believes and loves. For I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand for this also I believe, that unless I believed, I should not understand. End quote. Hermann Doivert has amply demonstrated that all theoretical thought rests on basically and essentially religious presuppositions which provide the framework for theoretical thinking. Theoretical thought is thus the product of pre-theoretical religious assumptions. The Enlightenment and modern faith in the autonomy of theoretical thought is neither a rational nor an empirical conclusion nor a scientific report. It is a religious faith and presupposition. But the faith of the Enlightenment and of subsequent humanism was, as Peter Gay stated, that, quote, philosophy was autonomous and omnipotent or it was nothing, end quote. Philosophy then and there began its modern departure from metaphysics and systematic thought to purely critical and analytical thought. Systematics in philosophy or theology implies for critical thoughts the tyranny of the absolute, of God, and hence true learning requires the rejection of systematics in favour of critical and autonomous thought. It is impossible to understand modern education apart from this concept of the autonomy of critical thought, nor is it possible to have truly Christian education without a radical departure from that concept. 
As long as the educational curriculum functions consciously or unconsciously in terms of the autonomy of critical thought, the school remains, however evangelical its faculty, an implicitly anti-Christian institution. Religiously, the implications of autonomous critical thought are far-reaching. As Van Til has summarised it, quote, Modern man has his own substitute for historic Christianity. He, not God, determines the goal of life. He must be his own standard of right and wrong. He must provide his own motivation. End quote. According to Dewey in Experience and Education, 1938, the pupil must learn to set his own ideals in terms of himself as the criterion. For education, this means that the pupil's role is not one of acceptance in terms of a basic authority and an intelligent development in terms of that authority of the Christian faith and Christian scholarship. Rather, the pupil is an explorer, a discoverer, whose one authority is himself. The Christian scholar must sharpen his critical abilities as he develops in terms of bringing all facts to the bar of the sovereign and ontological trinity and his word. The autonomous man brings all factuality to the bar of his critical autonomy. No fact which challenges his sovereignty and autonomy can be permitted. In a school, this means, first of all, that the pupil is a judge before he has any learning or wisdom. In fact, it is important that the very young child learn to view himself as judge and explorer before any system of thought subjugate his mind. The approach, therefore, is not to past learning in terms of appreciation and understanding, but in terms of critical analysis. On the college level, this becomes all the more explicit and vocal. In this writer's experience, the most despised and ridiculed professor at a major university in the English department was a man whose approach to poetry was in terms of a traditional appreciation, enjoyment and technical knowledge of music, metre, verse form and the like. For most professors and students, this professor's unabashed enjoyment of great poetry was shameful. It lacked the framework of autonomous critical thought, which is the hallmark of the modern intellectual. The result has been, in literature, a steady replacement of older classics with newer works which are amenable to the critical spirit. An example of the disappearing classic is the ode by the Reverend Charles Wolfe, written in 1817, on quote, The Burial of Sir John Moore. Not a drum was heard, not a funeral note, as his corpse to the rampart we hurried. Not a soldier discharged his farewell shots with a grave where our hero we buried. We buried him darkly at dead of night, the sod with our bayonets turning, by the struggling moonbeam's misty light and the lanterns dimly burning. No useless coffin enclosed his breast, nor in sheet, nor in shroud we wound him, but he lay like a warrior taking his rest with his martial cloak around him. Few and short were the prayers we said, and we spoke not a word of sorrow, but we steadfastly gazed on the face that was dead, and we bitterly thought of the morrow. We thought, as we hallowed his narrow bed and smoothed down his lonely pillow, that the foe and the stranger would tread o'er his head, and we far away on the billow. Lightly they'll talk of the spirit that's gone, and o'er his cold ashes upbraid him, but little he'll wreck if they let him sleep on in the grave where a Briton has laid him. But half of our heavy task was done when the clock struck the hour for retiring. We heard the distant and random gun that the foe was sullenly firing. Slowly and sadly we laid him down from the field of his fame, fresh and gory. We carved not a line and we raised not a stone but we left him alone with his glory. Wolfe's poem is a literal and accurate account of a military leader and hero, Sir John Moore, on the night before a British withdrawal. It is great poetry and accurate history, but the poem throughout moves in terms of a world of meaning which is now regarded as obsolete, a world of authority and faith, 
of prayer and courage, patriotism and loyalty? The poem evokes emotions quite alien to the concept of the autonomy of critical thought. Like many another great poem, it is therefore eliminated from textbooks and popular anthologies, and college majors in English can graduate without even knowing of the existence of such poems. The modern mood is one of quote-unquote alienation from quote, a world I never made, end quote. The rebellion against reality is not premised on a horror for sin and the fall against one's own depravity, nor is it a longing for more grace. Rather, it is, quote, alienation, end quote, from a world man did not create, and a demand that man become his own maker. Charles G. Bell speaks of, quote, Houseless home of our wanderings, vacant fields and tall and human cities. End quote. For these men, God's world is a world of nothingness. So that Archibald MacLeish in The End of the World sees its end thus. There is a sudden blackness, the black peel of nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. More recently, modern poetry and prose has abandoned meaning in favour of expression and has abandoned sentence structure and logical context. Some of its essentials are, according to Jack Kerouac, quote-unquote beat writer, quote, submission to everything, open listening, writes what you want bottomless from bottom of the mind, the unspeakable visions of the individual, no time for poetry, but exactly what is. Remove literary, grammatical and syntactical inhibition. No fear or shame in the dignity of your experience, language and knowledge. Composing wild, undisciplined, pure coming in from under, crazier the better. You're a genius all the time. End quote. In this concept of writing, the ability of the writer is implicitly in direct ratio to his abandonment of all authority other than his own experience. This abandonment requires the condemnation of God's authority in the name of the individual's authority. Second, since experience is emphasised and this experience is private experience, it is by implication lawless experience. Since it must be from the, quote, bottom of the mind, end quote, and since the autonomy of critical thought requires a declaration of independence from God, it is necessary that autonomous experience be lawless. As a result, in literature, the world of experience is increasingly criminal. The hero is the homosexual, the criminal, the psychopath, and increasingly the writer is also. Jean Genet is an ex-convict. Allen Ginsberg, a former mental patient, both treat perversion as the new normality. This is increasingly the meaning of experience. Experience in godliness is not seen as true experience. It is subjection to authority. Experience in stealing is educative and independent. Hence, there is a literary cultivation of such experience, and in the beatnik, hippie, and other movements the cultivation by students and ex-students of this true world of experience. This emphasis on private experience carries over even into science, where Eddington has defined, quote, the modern scientific philosophy, end quote, as, quote, selective subjectivism. Quote, selective subjectivism, which is the modern scientific philosophy, has little affinity with Berkeleyan subjectivism, which, if I understand rightly, denies all objectivity to the external world. In our view, the physical universe is neither wholly subjective nor wholly objective, nor a simple mixture of subjective and objective entities or attributes. End quote. In education, according to Dewey, quote, it is the business of the school environment to eliminate, so far as possible, the unworthy features of the existing environment from influence on mental habitudes. It establishes a purified medium of action. Selection aims not only at simplifying, but at weeding out what is undesirable. Every society gets encumbered with what is trivial, 
with dead wood from the past and with what is positively perverse. End quote. This refined, purified experience means the elimination of Christian faith, the Bible, prayer and worship. It means that the child is set into the, quote, experiential continuum, end quote, in which no standard exists save the private experience and pragmatic considerations. The state school textbooks are written to foster this refined anti-Christian experience. The need in Christian education is for textbooks designed to further the Christian experience of reality in terms of the absolute sovereignty of God. Third, the autonomy of critical thought is an educational philosophy which spells the death of educational, personal and social progress. For critical thought, progress means the elimination of Christianity. It means man's, quote, liberation, end quote, from the, quote, unquote, tyranny of God. Once Christianity is overthrown, no direction remains. Human welfare and human betterment are held to be social goals, but in the absence of norms, of objective standards, what is good and what is bad? What constitutes better or worse? The sociologist Eugen rosenstock Husey has called the contemporary relativism, quote, our invasion by China, end quote, the stagnation of Asiatic civilization has been a product of relativism, of ancient pragmatism, of an abandonment of the concept of absolute truth, of an absolute moral law. Quote, I suggest that the Theosophical Society has not imported into America 1% of the Oriental thinking which has been introduced by pragmatism. End quote. It is liberalism which leads to a static society to the Chinification of the West, by its relativism, by its assertion of the necessity for autonomous critical thought. This contemporary pragmatic faith, Rosenstock Hussey has summarized ably, quote, 1. Society is God, and otherwise there is no God who sends us into the world by calling us by our names. 2. Therefore, human speech is merely a tool, not an inspiration, a set of words, not a baptism of fire. 3. Society includes all men, regardless of their evil character. Everybody can be educated or re-educated. The body politic needs no self-purification. 4. The ipsy-dixit of authority is always out of place. Conflicts can be solved by discussions between equals. End quote. The revolution, quote, of modern man is an attempt to move backward from Christ to Adam to assert that the true grace of life is not in Christ but in the natural Adam and the fallen Adam is seen as innocent in his rebellion and most truly in paradise when most rebellious. End quote. The philosophe and the French Revolution sought to replace Christ with Adam. The concept of creativity was transferred from God to man. Quote, Adam the digger, the chopper, but especially Adam the pioneer, is like the creator, free and divine. Goethe expressed the new gospel when he wrote, Allah need create no longer. We instead create his world. End quote. In fact, the word, quote-unquote, creation itself changed its meaning completely during the 19th century, at least in French and to a certain extent in other languages too. The dernière création of a fashion and industry can be advertised in this new world because man himself becomes the Promethean creator of a new earth organized by free human will. The demiurge, the magic hero of antiquity, is turned into the, quote, creative mind, end quote, of genius, end quote. For the Jacobins, quote, Adam became a great messianic figure standing for the end of time when all men should meet again, end quote. If man himself, as Adam, governed only by the biology of his being, is his own god in paradise, then no progress is possible. Man becomes content with himself. His concept of life becomes static, but man, knowing himself to be totally depraved, 
and the world and himself in bondage to sin and death, knows also that the grace of God in Jesus Christ makes him victorious over sin and death. Progress is therefore a moral necessity. It is sanctification. The biblical doctrine of sanctification is basic to the belief in progress. A fourth consequence of the authority of critical thought is that education into critical thought becomes salvation. Education, therefore, becomes messianic. The result is, quote, government by textbooks, end quote, to use Rosenstock Hussey's phrase. Every modern country, whether fascist, communist, socialist or democratic, exercises control over textbooks in varying degrees, from indirect to, quote, dictatorial textbook administration, end quote. The school becomes the church of the philosophe, the new intellectuals, by means of which the humanistic creed is to be catechized to the generations. Between the Christian and the non-Christian perspectives, there is a vast intellectual and educational gulf. Quote, the Christian position seeks to make human experience intelligible in terms of the presupposition of God. The non-Christian position seeks to make human experience intelligible in terms of man who is conceived of as ultimate. End quote. Some of the presuppositions of Christian education are, first, the sovereignty of God and the authority of his infallible word. Both sovereignty and infallibility are necessary and inescapable concepts. If they are denied to God, they accrue to man or to some aspect of the universe or of history. The autonomy of critical thought is a concept asserting the sovereignty and, upon certain conditions, the infallibility of critical thought. There can be no compromise between these two positions. Second, Critical thought can better flourish within the context of biblical Christianity than autonomous humanism. Autonomous critical thought is critical of God, of Christian faith, of the scriptures, but not critical of man and the state. Where man and the state become humanistic, Christian critical thought is of necessity critical of man and the state because of its doctrine of sin. Autonomous critical thought moves to stifle such criticism because it is an attack on its presuppositions. There is thus a marked decline of philosophical thought as it progresses towards the conclusion of autonomous philosophy. Of this, pragmatism and existentialism are good examples. Christian education needs to emphasize Christian critical thought, a critique of man and society, in terms of biblical faith. Third, Christian education is frankly and honestly authoritarian, but it must assert that all education is authoritarian. The basic question is always, which authority, God or man? Status education today is education into authoritarian humanism. The Christian school is frankly organised in terms of God's authority and the ordained authorities God has given to man and family church, state, school and society. Fourth, Christian education must assert at all times the absolute law of God. For autonomous critical thought, the only absolute law is man's freedom from God. For the Christian, every sphere of life, the family, church, state, economics, agriculture, science, Mathematics and all things else are under God's absolute laws as manifested in their sphere. Christian education is a study of God's grace, of God's realms of law. Conflicts are thus not, quote, solved by discussions, end quote, but by the objective study of and reference to God's world of law. The fact that man's reaction to and study of that realm of law is subjective makes all the more necessary the exercise of Christian critical thoughts to avoid the confusion of man's experiential framework with objective reality. The fact of man's sin always conditions man's experiences, but because man is not ultimate, reality is not governed by man's experience. Man either learns or he suffers for his warped or erroneous knowledge. 
Moreover, since man was created by the same God who created all reality, man's being is governed by the same world of law, purpose and meaning which governs the whole of creation. Man's subjective experience is thus not alien to reality, but a part thereof and understandable in terms of God's law. Man himself witnesses to God against himself. The reality around man and within man can only be truly known in terms of the sovereign God who created all things. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all instruction and learning. Fifth, the purpose of Christian education is not academic, it is religious and practical. Man's purpose is to build the kingdom of God. This was Adam's calling. The creation mandate and call to man to know, subdue and use the earth under God. As Hills has written, quote, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air was God's program for the world and for the human race. This was the mandate which he gave them. It was God's will that Adam and his posterity should erect upon the earth a sinless civilization and culture, the splendor of which we cannot now even have the faintest conception. A civilization without sin and suffering, a civilization in which every gift of God would be used properly and to the fullest advantage, a civilization of perfect physical, mental and spiritual health, a civilization in which death would be unknown. Such would be the civilization and culture which would exist today if Adam had been obedient to the divine commandments. End quote. In the providence of God, man turned instead to Satan's plan for his kingdom of autonomy from God. In Satan's plan, every man would be his own God, knowing, that is, determining for himself in terms of his own wishes, what constitutes good and evil. Genesis 3.5 Autonomous critical thought had to be exercised against God, according to Satan. Yea, hath God said? Genesis 3.1 Through Jesus Christ, God's second Adam, God's plan was re-established and the program for God's kingdom announced to all nations who were summoned to discipleship under Christ. Matthew 28, 19-20 The task of Christian education is to obey and to further God's program in terms of his calling and word.